Hello and welcome to another episode of Supercoach Insider. My name is Ben. And I'm Chris. And welcome to our GWS Team Analysis Podcast. Yes, yes. Thank you for joining us. Um, starting off, we'll start with our socials as usual. So yep. we are facebook.com forward slash SE Insider. We are also on Twitter. So it's SE underscore Insider underscore. And Twitch, Chris? Uh, Twitch.tv forward slash SC underscore Insider. And YouTube. And YouTube is uh, just search for us on at Supercoach Insider. Wonderful. Yeah, pretty cool. So and we've got um, already six teams up on uh, all our major platforms. So the first six teams was uh, Adelaide, Brisbane, Carlton, Collingwood, Essendon, and Frio. Correct. Um, so if you want to check them out, they're all available on YouTube, all our major podcast platforms, SoundCloud, Spotify, TuneIn, all those mumbo jumbo. Yes, all, all of those. Pretty uh, cool. GWS, very interesting, very relevant yeah. uh, for their primos, um, probably not so much for some of their rookies this year. However, I actually star studded. Surprisingly, they have one of the uh, uh, one of the better rookie selections, and I think there's uh, there is spots there available to play. So I'll be interested to see how they go. But um, yeah, it's not as uh, one side as you might think with someone like GWS. No, I, I do like Hill and a couple others, but um, yeah, I think there's still a lot of talent that hasn't quite got an opportunity yet that might take it. So. That's also true. That's also true. Yes, we'll have a look. Well, look. Um, let's go through their year in review and let's dissect where they're at and where they're going to be this year. Um, look, last year they sold the farm and they raised their salary cap and pretty much blew everything because they thought that it was going to be their year to win the premiership. And they literally got absolutely destroyed by key personnel injuries. So if you have a look at it, Zach Williams went down early. Toby Green virtually missed the entire season. Josh Kelly was subpar the entire year with a groin injury. Rory Love was in and out with injury. Jamery Cameron got suspended and injured. John Patton was out for 10 games. Delito only played nine games again. Um, and Tom, Skill- Tom Scully had his foot issues that persisted. All oh, of those guys. And they made the eight. Just- and they still made the eight. Um, and they won their first elimination final. Um, unfortunately, got absolutely spatted, splattered by uh, Collingwood. But, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> just to- no remorse. No, no, whatever. Whatever. Um, they... So look, this year, uh, you know, that there's a lot coming back, but there's also people that they've lost because they blew their salary cup out of the water. So um, they've got the ninth hardest draw, according to Champion Data, and their double-up games are against Richmond, obviously difficult, Hawthorne difficult, Sydney, which is their derby, of course, Essendon, who, again, moving towards that top four, top eight sort of uh, scenario, and then, of course, they're still trying to pump up that rival with the Gold Coast, so there's two easy wins there. Yes. Um... <laughs> They only have four six-day breaks and no five-day breaks. So again, they're a bit a bit gifted that way. Um, they do have an incredibly hard start to the year. So they play uh, Essendon and Eagles away, Richmond, Geelong away in the opening four rounds. Ooh. So their first four are pretty hard and pretty tough. Um, so we'll see how we go. They have the round 14 by. So unfortunately, they share that with uh, Adelaide, uh, Gold Coast, North and Richmond. Um, so that, uh, you know, that's the one that you don't really want in terms of upgrading potential to. Um, but again, it, it works well for rookies, especially that first round of upgrades. So let's say you trade someone in round six, round seven as a GWS rookie. They've got six games to go through before that buy, yep. which is a good time to upgrade. So yeah, it, you can actually win out with them in terms of their rookies. Um, off season. So, um, they obviously had some trades and recruits. Um, they brought in uh, and uh, Shane Mumford, of course. Yes. Uh, probably on a dirt cheap wage, uh, considering his off season sh- shenanigans that we have highlighted in previous podcasts. Unfortunately, he's missing the first two rounds. I will go through Mumford a little bit more detail. And they also got in Tommy Sheridan. I'm not sure if he'll impact them at all. No, probably not. Um, more of a depth, depth player, I believe. Um, unfortunately, they lost quite a few important cogs. So Rory Lobb, who I think is important for their uh, ruck structure. Um, Dylan Shield, uh, amazing talent. Tom Scully, running machine, and uh, Will Setterfield, who never really got a start at uh, with all the midfielders down there at GWS. Um, so those are some pretty big outs. Um, for that reason, I can't really see them increasing their position. I think that if they, I think they will still make the eight, but I think they're going to be in that five to eight range. I don't can see them approaching top four with their tough draw um, and the loss of really key cogs. Um, however, they did really recruit quite well. So we'll go through their rookies first. Um, their first pick was pick 11, Jai Corwell, and uh, look, GWS rated Corwell enough to say that they think they didn't think he would be available at pick 11. They thought he was gone well before that. Midfielder with explosive pace and his excitement machine at stoppages. 
Um, definitely one to watch at JLT, 184 centimetres, 74 kilos. Unfortunately, injuries limited him to just three games last year. So that's why he slid to 11th, but he was really high rated he, at, at some stage in the top five. So someone who they want, will want to get games into. Um, he only managed one game from uh, Vic Metro where he co-captained the team with Sam Walsh. So that's the sort of level that they likened uh, Jai Caldwell with. It's about his body and getting that right first. And um, he can absolutely be a top-end midfielder forward in the future. Um, whether or not he gets uh, games this year will depend on how his preseason tracks, how his JLT is, and whether or not he gets a berth round one. He could want be one to take the you know Dylan Shields mid minutes or someone like that. So yes. I think there's others in front of him, but, but he they'll, might they'll, slot yeah, in some, have a fight on somewhere hands. in there. Yeah. Yep. Um, a big one as well. So pick fourteen. So they're only a couple of picks later. Was Jackson Hately again, big body midfielder um, who can play forward as well. Um, given his profile, I'm not sure he's really SC relevant in 2019, but he's likely behind Hopper. So I see Hopper as that big body mid yep. that will probably take those minutes. I think he's behind him. So it will depend on, again, his preseason form and how he goes, but he's 190 centimeters and 81 kegs. Uh, all Australian selection after a strong under 18s championship performance for South Australia. And he played senior footy last year at Central Districts. So he's nice. played Sanford level Well, footy. let's be fair, Hopper could have more injury issues anyway. So yeah, you exactly never know, right. even yeah. halfway through the year. And Haley um, was really highly touted, and uh, again, one that surprised even they were able to pick up a pick fourteen. So, and Hopper could hip hop and fall over. Yeah, right. Um, now, one that I really like is their next pick, Xavier Halloran. Uh, he's actually been in, in and out of my side as a starting selection because I think he might get mid time, um, so early, early game time. Sorry, uh, great size and speed uh, is all round package, hard to pass up. Similar in style to Jordan Degoe. His AFL ready body and great marking power, fantastic at stoppages. Has great leadership qualities, both captaining the Western Jets and Vic Country, the under-18 champs. 187 centimetres and 83 kilos, so he's AFL ready. Fifth in the yo-yo test of the combine, nine goals in 13 games. Average 18.8 disposals, including 13.9 kicks, so good ratio there. Um, average 4.7 tackles, 3.3 marks, and 5.5 clearances, as well as half of his um, disposals are contested. Nice. So That's what you want. Everything like that screams super coach to me. Um, not sure if he will get game time ahead of uh, Jackson Hatley and, of course, um, Jai Caldwell, but I'm looking at him as someone that uh, could really score well in super coach. If he gets game time, especially in JLT, we'll be watching out for him. Um, Ian Hill, so he's the next one. Hill's another. Um, cousin, uh, cousin of Stephen and Brad Hill, of course, plays pretty much exactly like them. So outside player, really fast, um, high vertical leap, um, excitement machine can play forward or along the wing. Um, his knock on him is, of course, he's um, 175 centimeters and 76 kilos. Um, now the Giants actually live traded to get him, so a lot of people don't know this, but uh, he was tra- they traded up four spots in the draft and they gave away a future fifth round pick to get him. So I don't know if they had any inside information or as to who was going to be the next selected over the next three picks, but they went and they traded away a future pick to get Ian Hill. Yep. So well, I guess if you're getting um, rid of a scully, you might want some run. Yeah. And again, so an outside runner. Um, look, he needs to hit the gym, definitely in his slot, and that's his knock on his game. But he's tight. I mean, the Hill brothers, he's only a couple of kilos lighter than Bradley Hill and Stephen Hill. Yep. It's, it's not like he's real small. It's it, it's that type. It's the rangy, um, you know, quick, fast-paced outside ball winner. He doesn't really need to put on a lot of weight. So I see him as someone who could definitely play this year. Um, the last one that they had was, uh, oh, sorry, it's not the last one. Uh, Kieran Briggs is also an, an, another, sorry, warranted selection in, um, in draft, in draft, sorry, in standard this year, uh, drafted as an academy product. So they actually got him, uh, I think out of the Riverlands area, um, for Western Sydney, they, GWS matched West Coast bid for the Ruckman, importantly, um, important for the list build because he's a Ruckman and he was the best in the draft. So definitely the best Ruckman in the draft this year. They don't have a Ruckman in, the, in their list. No. They have Shane Mumford, who they've just got in, Dawson. and Dawson Simpson, who's a backup Ruckman. They just gave away Rory Lobb. So Kieran Briggs becomes a very important option for them in development option. Yep. So I think this year will be a, literally a year under learning under Mumford. That's literally it. And then next year, he'll probably start round one as the main Ruck. I don't know how many if he gets games this year, um, but if he does, he might be one that you want to have as R3. So especially because round one and round two this year, Mumford's not playing. Mumford's not playing. So that's probably going to lend to Dawson Simpson if he's fit. But Kieran Briggs could come into calculations. 
200 centimetres, 98 kilos, all Australian ruck from, from the uh, all Australian, uh, so the national champs. And um, do you know much about um, Connor Iden? No. I don't know either. Right, fair enough. <laughs> Come on. That was good. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, usually it's you with those bad jokes. I know, I was picking the misses up from a hen's night last That's night. That's cool. Um, and we had technical difficulties and I need more coffee or beer. It's fine. Plus I'm talking a lot. I've got a, yeah. a lot of rookie information. I oh, know, and these ones for yeah. sure. Um, so all of those guys are, are, are uh, relevant definitely for this year. They could definitely play this year. I don't think about Connor Iden. I don't. I think it's a list need for, for them. He's a rounder defender who can play tall or small due to his athleticism. Um, listed as a key back who can go forward and kick goals, but he's an odd height. He's 190 centimetres and 89 kilos. Um, 10 goals in 14, in 14 games for John Falcons, but uh, which isn't bad as a key defender that swings forward. Uh, it's unlikely to get da- games unless um, injury forces it, so it might not be SC relevant this year. And that rounds out the rookies. Whew. Whew. Hoo-ha. All right, now you can start talking about Josh Kelly, right? Yes. <laughs> well, he did have end of season surgery on his troublesome hip. Yep. Well, while um, we're doing that, let's uh, let's play the highlights here ooh. Um, of that absolutely smashing game where he got a, a nice little two hundred and five against Carlton, and I'm sure this is what uh, Carlton fans will be looking at, saying, "I want Josh Kelly next year," and I guarantee you they're going for him. It's going to be a lot of teams that are going to be going for uh, Josh Kelly at the end of this season. Correct. So. And if um, GWS don't look like they're going to win a premiership and might go backwards, he might uh, jump ship. Yep. Cause that's I reckon they're going to have even more salary cap issues next year. So Yeah, um, they're not going to be able to offer him more. No, nah, no way. I don't reckon... I mean, the teams that are going to make space for this sort of guy, he's that Sydney? good. Sydney apparently have, have, have money. The space. They've that's got what the I mean. Money. They have money. Imagine them. Andrew getting... Ireland came out this Ooh. week and said, yeah, they've got money to go after a big fish next year. Ooh. Yeah, well, could be. Jeez, imagine that. Imagine Collingwood how, would have money next year. Imagine how upset. Well, yeah, Collingwood would have money every year. Yeah, that's right. Uh, they anyway. also got that brown paper bag money, eh? Hey? <laughs> <laughs> um, seven scores of 120 plus. Uh, still had five scores under 100. Yeah, but which is, a lot of 90s in that. Yeah, yeah. correct. Um, did average 119.6 in his last 10 rounds. Yep. Uh, including 146, a 149, a 130, a 130, and the 205. Yeah, unreal. Huge. Um, the question is really going to be, can he play 20 games? And if so, what can he get to? Because he can be an uber premium, right? Could I reckon if he plays 113 in a year where he was literally hampered by injury the entire year. Yep. Now, he's in peak condition. They literally said that he's flying around the track right now. So it's early. That's illegal, Chris. <laughs> it would be illegal. That's right? illegal. He's in no-fly that's, that's, zone. That's Shane Mumford kind of flying. <laughs> yeah. Um, he actually, so last year he battled OP, so osteo- osteitis pubis, and had a groin injury the entire year, um, and that just knocks you out. And what it means, generally speaking, is it, it impacts your running ability. Um, so he wasn't running very much in training, and therefore, and leaving it for the weekend, of course, and he would be in agony and then have to, you know, um, rest and repair, rest and repair during the week, and then go back and try and do it the next week. And so that's why it was a week-to-week proposition as to whether or not he even played last year. So if he plays 22 games, you can't not have him. The question mark is on his, obviously, durability. What do you think he can get to if he's a fully fit Josh Kelly playing 22 games? What can he average? Well, he could easily average like what McRae and stuff did, 129. I think as well. I think he's that good that he could be an uber premium 120 plus. Yep. So um, do you pick him? Do you pick Fife? Do you pick Oliver? Do you pick... McRae. McRae for yep. 70 grand more though. But... He's 6.17. He's still, I reckon he's undervalued at 6.17. I think you can um, quite easily lock in some decent stuff. The problem is, of course, their first rounds, as we said earlier, they're really, really difficult um, for start yeah. to the... Well, he's not going to be getting a 200 probably yeah. in those first few exactly rounds. Right. So, yes, if you're getting him, you're getting him for the long haul. Yeah, you got to see him as, I think he's going to be healthy for 22 games. So that's the thing. Yes, my man Kellen Ward's next. Yeah, you're all, you're all man. Uh, well, I remember I spoke to how he averaged like 90 or 89 in the first half of last year and then went bang like 114, Always. right? Yep. Well, basically did the same sort of thing again. So, Kellen Ward, um, first nine rounds, he averaged 93. Yep. And then his last 13 rounds averaged 112.7. Yep. So, he had 11 scores of a 110. Classic Kellen Ward. 11 scores of 110 plus, including a 131, a 156, and a 151. So, he has a big ceiling as well. Uh, great. So it was a difficult start to the year. Yep. I wouldn't start him in standard, but um, in draft, like I traded him. There's I got, two things you can do with Callum Ward. Here's the funny part. I traded uh, Jared Polek, who was averaging 100. Yep. Blake Akers, 
Blake Akers. Yeah, yeah, he was averaging yeah. hundred in and the he got injured line. the week after, didn't he? Yeah, he yeah, came yeah. back, uh, and the Pollock started averaging horrible. And I got Callum Ward, who was averaging not so great. Not, and not then bad, went, not bad, sir. <laughs> You've done this before. What, two one hundred players went went very good. But uh, yeah, love Callum Ward. As two a things you can do with Callum Ward: you can either a start him in draft because yes. I think it's overall the year is going to be a good option, and hold him. Or b in round fifteen you bring him in as your last up mid upgrade. Yep. And he ta- carries you through the back end of the season, gives you a 110 average over the back end. Well, correct. So basically, you're looking at the last couple times, 112.7 in the last 13 rounds. And yep. the year before that, I think it was about 114 for the last sort of 13 rounds or whatever it was. So, um, yeah, big back end player. Yeah. It's huge. Now, the next person is probably one of the most highly talked about um, premiums of the year so far. Everyone wants to know what's happening with Lockie Whitfield. Yes. The great article came out today. Is it today that it came out? About with Lockie Whitfield. Yeah, well, I was just checking it out today. So, Lockie Whitfield, I was telling the guys. Yep. Uh, so, basically, you all came out saying, Kevin Sheedy was saying, like, you know, some people are saying that Whitfield's going to go on the wing. And he's like, I'm not so sure about that because, yep. you know, if you have two guys that can run and gun off the halfback flank, he said, that's really damaging. And that's, you know, that'd be a weapon for any coach to have. Yeah. Uh, and then it actually followed that up by saying, Whitfield saying, uh, I really couldn't tell you where I'll play this year. But with Zach back fully fit, I think Leon wants to see how the two of us work together, which I think is great news. That's ter- That's the worst worded paragraph I've ever heard because here's why. That means they're going to use the JLT to figure it out. So you're not actually going to get the information you need to be able to make a viable purchase decision from the JLT. Right. Well, that's here, annoying. Here, here's the, here is the good news though, Chris. What's the good news? He played most of the season with a damaged lateral meniscus. Yep. He injured in with Essendon in round 10. So it got to the point, I think they lost four rounds in a row. Um, and basically from that point, he's like, well, our season's on the line. I don't. And they were at a point there where they could fall off a cliff yep. and they were losing every game. Yeah. And he's like, I, didn't, I don't want to miss four to six weeks yep. and have, have surgery. So they just taped him up. Yeah. So he, so he was saying here, so for the rest of the year, he only really trained when he had to. Are you watching this absolute smashing when... Is this the game where they uh, actually took two? Yeah, they rested two players on the on off the field and still managed to smash them. Yes, that was so funny. Uh, so <laughs> for the rest of the year, he only trained when he had to. Uh, so he did a lot of swimming just to make sure he could play. So basically, he didn't do much training. He just got out there and played, and still made all Australian. Oh, he's doing laps. It's all good. Huge. Uh, look, so there's yeah. So if he's behind the ball, it's way 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 better from a super coach perspective because he's uh, uh, right now he averages ninety nine. You could see him averaging one hundred five. Well, maybe pushing a 110. Well, his last if he doesn't rounds, get that role, it, I, I can't see him doing it. Well, here's the funny the part, right? His last 10 rounds, he averaged 111.1. Yep. With the damaged meniscus. Yep. So, and that, so, that, so that includes his two finals, right? Yeah, because so, he's getting two, yep. two 130 pluses. So 106, 115, 97, 85, 113, 106, 105, 107, 141, 130, 80, 61, 135, 133. Yep. Yeah, huge. Not, not bad. Look, not I bad. think he's consistent. Um, I, I've said, and I'll say this repeatedly, that you should not move him out of his role. He's an all-Australian. Um, why why would you move him? Like, There's no reason to move him to a wing. You've got other people that can move yeah, to a wing. Like Taranto. Or you've got rookies that can do it. Yeah. You've got the best in his position. He's the best. Right now, if for the next five years, I am if you pick a halfback, that, you know, I, I am the best. Um, if you're going to pick a halfback that is going to be damaging, can rack up the numbers, good defensively, and can use the ball exquisitely, he's the he's your guy, right? Yep. So I would prefer to see him behind the ball, in which case he comes into calculations for me. Yep. But if he's not that, if he plays on a wing, I'm not... Yeah, then he's like maybe a 97 he's, average or he's, 95. He's still score well and yep. a great in draft because regardless, yes. draft's good. Draft's good. But he's not going to take that next step. Now, the other thing, of course, is... Um, he probably won't get as much of an advantage from kickouts as others. So yes, he takes kickouts, but he doesn't take the. He's not the number one kickout um, person. That is Heath Shaw. So Heath Shaw will play again this year. He's thirty three. I'm pretty confident that he'll play. He took the most kickouts this year uh, at eighty four and still missed the last two games of the season. So he's probably up around that sort of ninety five mark, which puts him around the fourth or fifth highest in the comp. Whitfield had around 54 over the year, including those last two rounds where he did actually um, do the kickouts. One thing I want to know, and I actually tweeted um, Fantasy Freak about this last night, but I haven't got any um, information back, is who took the kickouts when um, Williams was playing? So Zach Williams came back in the, in the finals. I don't have any stats on who took the kickouts those two games, 
But I'd like to see if it's Zach Williams or Lockie Whitfield. That'd be an interesting... Yeah, right. Just, just to, just to see. Okay, so what's going to happen this year? It'd be interesting. Now, the one thing as well works in his favour, or doesn't, depending on how you look at it, is that Whitfield was the number one target from kick-ins. So Shaw would kick the ball to Whitfield, 20 metres out or in the pocket or whatever, and then he'd do the long kick, right? Now... Again, what are they doing this year? Well, is it Zach can, Williams now from... Now you can bypass him. Is it Zach Williams from 20 metres out all the way to the wing? Because he's the one with the penetrating kick, right? So it's Zach Williams doing that, bypassing Whitfield and then taking points out away from his game? How is how is that work? So again, there's, there is a couple of question marks there. I, I still love Lockie Whitfield as a pick, and I think he's going to be a great pick. He's, I think he's, I, I, But whether or not he's a value pick determines is determined by his role. So we'll I'll wait and see on that one. I'm for the same price, or for a little bit extra, I'm probably going to go Sicily. I just think it's... If you, if, if they play the same amount of games, Sicily definitely 100% averages more, in my opinion. Sicily out-averages... I reckon we can take a bet on that if you want. Lucky Whitfield. I'm taking Sicily to out-average Lucky Whitfield 100%. Oh, that's a good one. Do you want one? Possibly. You want, you want a piece of that? I want to think about it first. Oh, he's got to think it's about close. it. It's close. Oh, I like these bets. Get it, close. The, get it on the bat train. If you want to bet with us, hit us up. We love a carton. It's, it would be close, Chris. Yeah. I'm not I, sure what I would bet for it, but uh, definitely wouldn't be the uh, it's, Petrarca bet. It's close enough to be like, yeah, like mm. we could totally, like it could go either way. It probably could go either way. Probably good. Now, uh, last premium that I want to talk about is, of course, Stephen Coniglio, who actually went into premium status last year, averaging 108 over the season. Yes, um, scored 12 big. tons during the year and uh, two in the finals as well. Seven of those tons were 120 plus uh, with two 150 scores and only one sub score, score sub 82, which is just, that just bleeds consistency in my opinion. He'll be incredibly unique. He, there's not many people that are going to run Steve Coniglio because I think that he's probably almost capped at what his potential is. Yeah. I think he's around a 110 average cap. Yes. I don't think he's going to be real more than that. And it's because of his kicking. His kicking is not that great. Do you know his average with and without Kelly? Oh, I love no. Tell me this. Oh, uh, so Ooh, I like a unique. Without Kelly, he averaged ninety six point three. Wow. When when Kelly was playing, he averaged one thirteen point two. I like that. Now, what I would like to see is the the, the correlation between that and wins and losses. So the Whitfield is the same. Whitfield averages more with Kelly in the team as well. So is it just because Kelly's so good that they win games and therefore they're in winning sides? That's why, or is it because Kelly actually impacts him? Yeah. I'm, I don't know. Maybe she's positively influences it. Well, that's how good Kelly is. He's yeah. a match winner. That, I, if you're going to throw $1.2 million dollars at anyone next year, it's got to be Josh Kelly. Yep. Oh, God damn it. Um, <laughs> I, just, I just get excited when I talk about Josh Kelly. And this is why like, it's so hard to not have him. Like, I don't have him in my team right now, but it's only because I can't fit him in with the structure that I'm rolling. Yep. So... Um, all right, let's get into some mid prices. There's quite a few. Um, most of them are draft relevant. Um with some uh, relevancy and standard. First one is Harry Himmelberg, 384k forward, average 87.8 over the last 13 game, games of the season, including a 55 in the semi-final loss. Yep, nickname so, Harry Highpants. Yeah, <laughs> now he only averaged 70 for the year, so massive draft smoker. He'll be available late in draft. Yeah, I don't know if I have him on my list. Yeah. Oh, he must be actually averaging 70, yeah. The... The issue is, um, of course, he averaged that while uh, Jeremy Cameron was suspended and John Patton was injured. So he was one of the main targets up forward. Yeah, so don't have him. So his role will be dependent on whether or not he can get that. Whether or not he even plays round one, if they're both fit, is another question. But definitely a breakout candidate. 87.8 over the last 13, I think, is, is nice for a forward. And especially in a year where there's really not... You're writing it down. No. <laughs> you, if you pick him up, I'll tell you what, I'm going to be angry, eh? Uh, I told you last night, I said there's people that aren't on your list that you should be looking at, like Harry Himmelberg. You're right. Anyway, um, th- so I think you'll pick him up late in the <laughs> year. I'm writing down the stats as well. The, the problem is, though, the forward line this year, there's not really many mid-prices that are decent selections. So there really isn't. There's like um, Toby Green, who's obviously injured, and, and that's one of my next ones. So you know, you can look at someone like a Toby Green, um, who's 354K. Where is he here? 354K. And everyone knows he's an elite scorer and he can score really well. He's averaged 90 and 96 being as a forward and over 100 when he was playing midfield. Um, but it's what is his body still, like. Still not training. He's not even training. So uh, he, not was, he was running. Yeah, he was running not, on... Not even not training, no, no, not he, running. He was running. He was running. He was um, on the, the machine that takes some of your weight off and that sort of stuff before Christmas. So he was oh, running yeah. a couple of times. But, um, yeah, but no, he's, he's not back to full training running. 
So he's not on the park with yeah, all the he boys. Didn't, he didn't participate yeah. in the 2K time trial? No. No, he wouldn't because that's yeah. full speed. Yeah. And he's not running full speed, so... So, yeah, in the forward line, there's not really many in that sort of three to 400,000 price bracket as you would pick as a breakout. So that's why he comes into consideration in standard. I, I, I wouldn't pick him unless there was an injury to Patton or Jeremy Cameron in the preseason. Yep. But as in draft... I'm someone that I can look at real late on the bench. Yep. Get in there. So especially that, for a late league, like an 18 man league. At 354k for Toby Green, he doesn't have to be super fit to score well. Like if he starts round one, I'd be tempted. I don't want I to because Green he hasn't go... trained, but Green can impact as a small forward before getting his match fitness yeah. up to then push up the ground. So I think Green goes early in draft. I think people pick him up as say at F3. Ooh. I think people pick him up that early. F4 would be better. Uh, yeah, I, I'd love him yeah. in F4, but I don't reckon we're going to get him there. Yeah, right. Um, Zach Williams, I think he's probably the best um, uh, mid-pricer of the year. I think yep. he's got real value. Um, highly underpriced due to missing the entire season in 2018. Zach Williams came back to play in the elimination final. First game back, 117, whatever. 23 disposals, 20 kicks and 9 marks. Um <laughs> He came back the following week and, and hit a 77 in a loss, of course, when uh, Colin would smash him. Yep. Um, <laughs> but he's an elite ball user, someone that they want in the ball in the hands of. And after going 88 and 93 in 2016 and, tw- and 2017, I can only see him going up. And I'm predicting a 95 average, especially if he gets kickouts. Yeah. Um, I'm still waiting on those stats. And a 400k bargain. If he's, if he's their main kickout taker... 95 is undervaluing him even. Yeah. Uh, he could go 100 plus. Well, if he's, if he's bypassing people with a long kick, then it's definitely possible. Well, you get rebound 50, um, yep. effective disposal, meters gained. Yep. Like, it could be four, and also four the, points the, per possession. And also, the long kick has also um, got heater written all over it as well. But yeah. the problem with... Just because of running. Well, the problem with yeah. heater is, though, is that, say, Zach Smith will be able to... Uh, Zach Williams, sorry, will be able to probably get more meters... Before he kicks, whereas Heater will probably take two. Zach Williams is more of a penetrating, like, bullet. That's what I mean. He'll, no, but he'll be able to run further than yeah. Heater to kick it. Heater's right. the sort of sky kick. Like, he, he's got two kicks. He's got his pinpoint 20-meter kick yep. and his sky his, kick 50 his, meters. Yeah, 50 meters yeah. to a contest. Um, and he's my next one. So I've put him really as a mid price. I don't think he's going to be uh, re- relevant as a premium this year, but he is a 492k defender. Um, yes. He did end the averaging 90 in a year of ups and downs. Got injured in round 21, ending a season early with a, um, I think he had a patella issue uh, with his knee. But he's up back on track. He's in full training. Yeah, he ran the 2K time trial. Yes. So, but he did only start running again in November and he was on a modified before Christmas. Yeah. So it's only now that he's actually back yeah. in full training. Pretty but much. at least he's back at training. So. Yeah. Um, he is 33. So I think he still will get um, uh, play most of the year. I think next year is going to be the year where he starts to play less games. Um, depending on how much Kate Simpson Tiger blood he's got in him. Um, and he did lead the club with uh, kickouts with 84. So that could mean an uptick in his um, in his scoring, but I think it's more likely if he was going to go down to 85, then he probably stays at 90. So I don't think there's really much value in the pick, especially from a standard relevancy point of view. But draft value, I think that he's got there. But depends on... Who gets picked? I mean, sure, someone that perennially gets picked pretty early in draft. So. Yeah, I think he'll get picked more around the mark, though, this year, yeah. based on... Yeah, you know, he was overhyped mainly by me last year, but, yep. uh, yeah, it didn't do too bad. We did say he probably wouldn't average lower than a 90, and we kind of got that just on. Yep. Um, so, yeah. Nick Haynes, late draft selection, average 75 in the piece, but uh, had a PB this year in the elimination final with 139, which wasn't included in his average. Huge. So a little bit of value there. He had four tons this year, three scores in the 90s. Makes him a decent backup option or, or, or you know, maybe a D5 or a bench option um, that you can look at. I don't mind Nick Haynes as an option, and he will guarantee to be starting. Problem is that he's generally their second tall. So Phil Davis and uh, Nick Haynes are going to be your one and two. Um, so he gets his points from peeling off and intercepting the ball. And he's also a fairly good user, though. So they do um, get the ball in yep. his hands, which is good. Jeremy Cameron, 441k forward. Oh, um, Jeremy, high uh, elbow Cameron. Yeah, still might hurt. <laughs> so, so worth it. Um, I, I, he got worse. He's not getting better. And I think with GWS getting bet- worse, I don't. I can't see him increasing his average. He's down to 81 now. He's nowhere near the player that he was when he was averaging in the mid-90s. Um, I don't know if that's team-related, structure-related, or the fact that the league's now... What he was doing when he was doing that was he would be one out in the goal square. I have the whole 52 himself. I don't know. I reckon Cameron could out-average uh, out Dixon this year. <laughs> well, is that one you want to take? 
Because Dick Dixon's actually, I've watched a couple of press conferences with Dixon, and Dixon looks all right. Looks like he's going to be a stay-at-home full forward this year now with the ruck inclusions. Oh, yeah. And he's like, it's good. I'm not going to have to run around and get injured all day. So he's looking forward to playing in the goal square. All oh, right, and they get three goals a game at 60 points. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, you've got to remember he's got to take like seven it. contested marks a game. And then spray it yeah. <laughs> for three goals. Um, now, Taranto is someone that I, I don't know what to do with at this stage. Oh, so, I like Taranto. I like Taranto as well, but he lo- lo- lost his forward status and he's still 481k. If he maintained his forward status, he would definitely be on a lot of people's radars for standard and definitely draft. But average 88... Um, he could definitely be one that benefits. He was actually pushed behind the ball towards the back end of the year um, when they had a, little, a few injury concerns. So he goes forward you know, with the exclusions of Scully and, and Shield. Um, I don't know what he does, but he had seven tons for the year, 590 plus scores. Yeah. You know? So he averaged 96.6 of the last no- uh, last seven games yep. and averaged 94.6 the first six. So he kind of lost his way in the middle. Yeah. Yep. And that's when he moved behind the ball. So I think that if he was around the ball um, in midfield, mo- yep. pushing forward. I think he could actually get a lot more run on the wing. Yep. Uh, maybe so, maybe some extra midfield rotations, but I'd rather a hopper or some of these new young big bodies in there. My preference is you play Taranto on a wing and you play what yep. we feel behind the ball. But I'm yep, not and a sure. Delidio will play the fiddle on the sideline because he won't be on the wing. <laughs> Just avoid Delidio. Whatever you do this year, Is avoid. that your avoid? It is on my avoid list. Yeah, that's fair. Um, we spoke a little bit about Jacob Hopper. I think he's obviously going to be one to really get some more inside minutes this year. No, nah, Hopper's my breakout for the year. He's my Clayton Oliver 2.0. Yeah, pe- oh, I said people predicting a breakout. I don't know. He's got a long way to go because his numbers don't stack for a breakout. Um, breakout. He, he will left, definitely get more mid-minutes, but he only had two tons this year. Um, of uh, last season, he had eight, uh, five scores. Sorry, uh, half of his scores last year were under eight, uh, with, uh, eighty, with five of them under sixty-three. Give him time. Well, I break mean, out. That's why it's going to be a one door. It's going to yeah. be a for I'll me. He's keep my keep an eye on, but I'm not starting. And I probably my won't have him in draft. I wouldn't do it in standard because of his body. I'd, I'm going in draft. Yeah, he's my boy. Break out the next Clayton Oliver. He'll average a hundred. Now, the last mid, uh, mid-price mid that we just need to touch on quickly, I know right this has been a long pod because, again, they've got a lot of yep. relevancy. Write that down. Um, Shane Mumford, 320k ruck, of course, so he's super cheap. He's only 33. Like, And it's, it's, it's turning 33 later this year. He's, he's young. So he's not old at all. He, he, for a ruckman, he's definitely got some uh, legs left. And he, he had a lot of niggles. So one of the reasons why I retired is that his body just wasn't coping. He had niggles all throughout the year, and he was playing through pain every week. He had a year off. Yep. Come back fresh as a fiddle. Misses another two games. A little bit of an early season yeah. break from some shenanigans. No wonder he feels fresh as... Fresh as a daisy, yeah, right? Nothing, nothing heals pain like a <laughs> bit of codeine. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, I think he's still got something to give. Uh, look, has averaged 90 plus since 2010. Um, three years of 100 plus and two years 112 and 114. Ooh. Yep. Definitely one that you can see. And the new ruck rules will be out bodying yeah. everyone just. So, with his, the, the size of that guy's chest, he's, he's a massive man mountain. Like, he could 100% body people, take more possessions, get more clearances. Yep. And the, you get a lot of points as well for that first possession clearance. Imagine so, him versus Steph. Just oh, chest pump. Looking forward to that. Chest pump. Just get in there. Looks <laughs> <laughs> um, like a bird almost. I think he's someone that you could absolutely lock in as, a, as an R2 if you had a, a capable R3. So you'd have to have a Naismith or a Longer or a Zach Clark. Now, right now, I'm running Cruiser and Zach Clark, but for the same price, I can run um, Mumford and Naismith or Mumford and Longer. Yep. So uh, is that a better option? It, it could well be. I'm seriously thinking about switching out um, Cruiser for a, uh, for a Mumford, and it will definitely depend on JLT. Whoever scores better in the JLT is going to get my vote. That's literally how it's going to go. Yeah, right. But those are the two are value considerations. I think Mumford is a real, real good option. So one to uh, to, to, to take an eye on. Um, now avoid Adam Kennedy. Yes. Um, so he came back. So his stats are deceiving. Came back after a long injury layoff, um, and he averaged 87 of the last seven games, over which is a bit of a flash in the pan. Unfortunately, he posted a 42 and a 74 in the finals, making him a nine-game average of 81. So... If you're looking at him as a standard breakout, I wouldn't be doing it. His role is going to be taken up and absorbed by other players. He's not going to get that uh, as he was. I'm just laughing at Brett Delidio's Brett Delidio. comments. <laughs> Held together by Klingrap. <laughs> Brett Delidio just avoided all costs. 
Uh, but yeah, I think the Giants could definitely make the eight. If not, they're going to be close to it. So um, that pretty much rounds it up. Wraps us up. Right. Yeah. Thank you very much for bearing with us. Um, GWS, no matter what sort of format, they are definitely relevant. And um, yeah. can't lots wait of to rookies, see. lots of mid prices, lots of premiums. Oh. Oh, it's all there, and, the, and they're flooded with mid prices because you know people finally get the opportunities a bit later, and that's, yeah. that's even the, the better part of it. So exactly right. really keen to see what's going on. Uh, thank you for bearing with us, and uh, we'll continue on as we do. Thanks, guys. Catch you soon. Peace. Bye.